week until the fateful D-Day, a light invasion preparation shaped up on a staggering scale. The million and one details took on a pattern against a backdrop of suspense and anticipation on the part of forces and civilians in Britain and jittery Germans across the channel. Never before in the world's history has a military operation been so heralded by both sides as was the Second Front. Troops, tanks, and transport are all loaded on 4,000 ships. They put to sea to await the crucial moment. Guarding them are the guns of two mighty task forces of the combined navy. Overhead, the air forces provide an invulnerable protective ceiling. Before dawn, Tuesday, June 6th, the word is given, advance. The forces of liberation move to their rendezvous with destiny. The invasion is on. make their touchdown on the Normandy beaches just as the sun scatters the mists of early morning. The mighty naval bombardment has done well its job of paralyzing enemy batteries. Although the landings achieve tactical surprise, Strong north winds make the business of landing equipment extremely hazardous. The much vaunted west wall crumples before our whirlwind advance. As the bridge heads are established, supplies, armor, and reinforcements pour from the landing craft. The Canadians meet considerable fire on the beaches as they work their way into the defenses. There is stiff hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the little coast towns, but the citizen soldiers of yesterday are now a hardened mass of professional killers. They have learned and improved upon the lessons of Dieppe. Then the prisoners start screaming back. Some of them still dazed from our terrific concentrations of fire. Rommel, with reserves taken straight from the march, launches repeated counter thrusts. But one by one, they are fought to a standstill. Headway is made against ten Nazi divisions. One of the enemy units, surprised on maneuvers, was composed of lads from the Hitler Youth Movement. Like their older comrades, they are glad to be out of the war. They begin to doubt the invincibility of their Fuhrer. It's a far cry from those far-off days when British troops were leaving these shores under pressure from the Nazi invaders. Then it was our burned-out tanks which littered the road. Our troops were fighting a last gallant stand for life and home. Years of grueling toil have built up a storehouse of materials which make it possible for us to force the enemy from his strong fortifications. Thanks to blood, sweat, and tears, we may now master the roads which lead to Berlin. D-Day iron rations are a thing of the past, with the friendly French countryside to draw from. The liberated people take kindly to our Canadians. Despite the necessary damage inflicted on the countryside through warfare, there are a hundred smiles for every frown. Bridgehead deepens. On to Paris. In an operation of this magnitude, heavy casualties are to be expected. 
It is good to know that during the initial stages of the invasion, casualties were extremely low. The great organization of the Army Medical Corps is ready to take care of many more wounded than claim their attention. The only complaint from the wounded lads is that they're sorry to be out of the fight. They want to be back with their comrades who are fighting forever forward, deeper into France. Prisoners, too, land on the English coast in ever-growing streams. Ours the cream of fighting power, led by the craftiest of generals. We look with sober confidence to the future. In the words of General Montgomery, we have a great and righteous cause. Let us pray that the Lord, mighty in battle, will go forward with our armies and that his special providence will aid us in the struggle. With stout hearts and enthusiasm for the contest, let us go forward to victory. Meanwhile, on the Italian front, the fair countryside of the Leary Valley, in all its early summer bloom, is the setting for a crushing drive aimed at the very heart of occupied Italy. The 8th Army has been moved secretly from the Adriatic flank to join the 5th Army. They swing into a frontal attack on German fortified positions, sweeping through them to within sight of the formidable Hitler line. Here, Canadian 8th Army units fight together for the first time in this campaign as a Canadian Corps. They strike the blow which opens the second phase of the war in Italy. Battle-hardened warriors of the Dominion, fighting inch by inch as they move doggedly forward, spearhead the attack on Kesselring's last fixed lines of defense in southern Italy. Preceded by a withering barrage from massed artillery and covered by the full might of our Mediterranean Air Force, the Canadian Corps moves into the deep maze of concrete pillboxes, wire and tank traps, which is the Hitler line. Bearing on their shoulders the burden of a vital mission, Canadian tank men form part of a special task force. They meet stiff opposition from crack enemy troops. Fighting into the line to a depth of five miles in relentless close combat, a wide breach is made, allowing our full force to stream through. after the misguided maniac whose minions built it, this impregnable wall was going to halt the advance of the Allied armies. Sledgehammer blows from Canadian armor and infantry cracked it wide open. Prisoners move back in hundreds the crack troops who tried to withstand our blows. Men of the Nazi elite corps, the 1st German Parachute Division, the 19th Panzer Grenadiers, they've met more than their match. There is no halt to our steamroller advance. Pouring up the Leary Valley, the next strong point to be overwhelmed is Caprano. Important as a vital road junction, Caprano is taken after a stiff assault. Before the engineers can throw up bridges, two companies of an Ontario battalion poured the fast-flowing stream to be first in the town. Only 30 Germans are left to dispute the entry. They lie among the ruins. With the backbone of enemy defense broken, with the 5th Army troops cutting all southern highways from their Anzio beachhead, and with Kesselring's 10th Army in full retreat, it's a war of movement and fast movement. Canadians chasing ragged enemy remnants straddle Highway 6 on the way to the capital. Ahead, the shining towers of Rome beckon them on. A last bitter skirmish of armored units and the Allied armies are in possession of the Eternal City. The enemy is suddenly gone from the places for which a few hours before he had been fighting with the greatest savagery. Rome, that ancient ruler of the world, takes her liberators to her ample bosom. Mercifully spared the horrors of large-scale bombardment, her people are in a delirium of joy. 
They welcome the victors with flowers and smiles while guns still roar close by. The first enslaved capital of Nazi oppression has been liberated. Once more, the ancient forum is full of gaiety and happy throngs. Never again will it resound to the hysterical ranting of power-mad gangsters. The Allied armies will drive forward, forward until all Italy is free, all Europe is liberated from the heel of the tyrant. Forward to victory and freedom and peace. <laughs>